Hi, my name is Jim and today's topic is uh, pulse width modulation and this is a control technique that supports efficiency. It's the superstar of power control because it it offers this advantage compared to other techniques. Now we're going to start by comparing a resistive control circuit to a pulse width modulation control circuit. And a resistive control circuit uses a device called a rheostat, <coughs> which you may or may not be familiar with. There are three symbols for it. One is a variable resistor showing two terminals. The other is a potentiometer where the two terminals are going to be one end of the pot and the wiper. Or a potentiometer can be shown with the wiper and one end connected together. So these two are effectively the same. So what we're going to do is take a rheostat in series with a load, do a little bit of math, and then compare it to PWM. So this is going to be our resistive circuit. Um, our load in this case is going to be a light bulb. And the resistance of the filament we're going to let be equal to 10 ohms. And the rheostat's in series with it. Now, <clears throat> before continuing, I have to say that the resistance of a uh, incandescent light bulb is a function of the temperature. It's not linear, which is typically why an incandescent will burn out when you turn it on, because you're dealing with a, a surge which can be 600% the normal operating current. But we're going to just let this be a constant 10 ohms, and at uh, full brightness, completely turned on, the value of this resistor will be 0 ohms, so we'll have 10 volts appearing across uh, the, uh, the light bulb. So as you can see, um, what we have is that um, P is going to be 10 watts, that is 10 volts. It's not very clear. 10 volts. Divided by 10 ohms is 1 ampere. Power is 1 ampere times 10 volts. Uh, going to be um, 10 watts. 10 volts across the bulb, as I said. Um, and the R button is 10 ohms is given. Now, what is the bulb at 4 watts? What's going to be the voltage across this bulb at 4 watts? And what I'd like you to do is pick a, volt, a number for this voltage. Just think about it for a second and pick the number. It's got to be between 0 and 10, of course. Got the number? Okay, let's, let's check it out. <coughs> pull this up here. So uh, we're going to start by saying that P equals V squared over R and if we solve for V we see it's the square root of PR uh, as discussed before equals the square root of 4 watts times 10 ohms equals the square root of 40 equals 6.32 volts. Now that's a very non-obvious answer. Uh, anybody getting within 10% 10, 10 of that, you know, it's really a good guess or you know how to do the calculations because it's not obvious at all. And what we have to remember at this point is power is a function of the voltage squared or the current squared. And if you say, well, power is V times I, remember that V can be replaced by I times R giving us an I squared or it can be replaced by uh, v squared over R, which gives us a V squared. So it's not a linear function of voltage and current. And that is why we end up with this, this strange number. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to call this the effective voltage. And the reason that I'm using these terms is there's going to be an AC and a DC component. And effective is going to mean the inclusion of the DC and AC component where RMS is just going to be the AC component. So I have to be very careful that I don't cause confusion with that. So V effective is going to be in forthcoming examples to sum when we turn this thing on and off of an AC and DC component. One further point is that we have direct current DC and duty cycle DC. So I tried to write out duty cycle everywhere to avoid confusion with that. So DC is used in three places. One is the scope for direct couple, one is direct current, and the other is duty cycle. So when you see that, you have to put it into the right context. 
So going forward then, if V bulb effective is 6.32 volts, we can say that the current through the circuit is going to be equal to the voltage divided by the resistance, which comes out to be 632 milliampers. Okay, that kind of makes sense because we know when the bulb is full on at 10 watts, it's 1 amp here, so 632 milliampers, you know, it, it passes that safety check. Uh, going further, um, the resistance across the dimmer, that's this guy. What, what's the value of R for this is going to be equal to the difference in voltage. So we have uh, 10 volts on this side and 6.32 volts on this side. So this is going to be the difference between these, these two voltages divided by the current flow through this, uh, which is our uh, 632 milliampers. And what we end up with is we find that the resistance of the dimmer um, at this duty cycle is, uh, is uh, uh, 5.82 ohms. Okay, so when this is 5.82 ohms, the bulb ends up dissipating 4 watts. Now, everything's about efficiency these days. And um, if we go to find the efficiency on this here, first we'll note that the P total, the total power we're being used, is going to be 10 volts times 632 milliampers. So we have 10 volts, 632 milliampers. And that's going to be P total. So it's the supply voltage times the supply current. Uh, and we know that uh, the power output divided by the power input is going to give us a ratio, and the efficiency, which is uh, the Greek symbol nata, is equal to this, and we're going to multiply it by 100%. So it's power output over power input. That makes sense. Uh, 4 watts divided by 6.32 watts that we calculated um, uh, where did we calculate it? I guess we didn't well anyway that's what it is uh, it was going to give us 63.3 uh, percent efficiency which is uh, really bad so let me do that calculation just just to do it here. We have 6.32 volts, uh, or um, 632 milliampers, um, <coughs> times, or I'll square this, times 10 ohms, and. Um, just want to not overlook anything here. So, 0.632 squared times 10 ohms is 4 watts, 3.99 uh, 4 watts, which um, is what we have. So, okay, I'm satisfied with that. Just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that the 4 watts is a direct function of the duty cycle as uh, we will see <coughs> so we're at 63.3 percent efficiency and that's not really good so before we go into this more let's take a look at two extremes one is when the pulse width uh, signal is 100 percent which is fully turned on and I've kind of went to a practical circuit here because uh, effectively we're going to have some controlling device to do it. You know, I just can't put down a generator and make it happen. There's going to be some electronics involved. So what I did is I showed a P-channel FET and this is connected to VCC and I let the RDS on here equal 250 milliohms which is a um, quarter of an ohm and the gate of this goes to a signal I call PCM control not worried about that. The load, our 10 volt light bulb, is connected uh, against ground and what our PWM signal looks like is this. Now <clears throat> what you're looking at here this is called a PWM period 
and a PWM period is the time where a pulse width modulation waveform repeats itself. Now at 100% it's not too exciting because it's on basically all the time and I can make this PWM period um, in some cases a lot of different values and this is going to be capital T. So to make the point if um, I choose to switch the load on and off 1000 times a second which would be our period T is one millisecond. The light would respond exactly the same if I made the period um, 50 milliseconds. It's going to be on all the time. So there's constraints on the PWM period and when you set this up in a PWM controller you choose what this is. Now there's realistic values for this. For example if I made this period really long, the human eye would be able to see it flash. Not so good. So we'll talk about this a little bit longer, a little bit later rather. But here what I'm showing is 10 volts and this is constantly on and the only reason that I've drawn these little lines here is to show that in one period it's going to be 100%. This is always on 100% of the time. So if we work through this, is what we see now at 100% is doing the calculations here is V bulb is going to be equal to 10 volts divided by R total which is going to include the 250 milliohm RDS on of the uh, controlling transistor, the MOSFET. And the best I can get out of this is 9.76 uh, volts. So at 100% I'm going to have a little bit of loss. Now, <clears throat> at 90%, it's in, in values below, this is going to be different. It's only at 100% that we can't achieve the same results of a rheostat. So the rheostat, when it's always on at 0 ohms, gives us some slight advantage. But if it's always on, we don't need a rheostat. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to be taking into account the RDS on of our control electronics which is almost always a MOSFET. So um, <clears throat> what we get for the bulb here if we calculate this at 100% would be V squared over R and it comes out to be 9.52 watts so instead of 10 watts at 100% the best we can do is uh, 9.76. Now let's take a look at the efficiency Nata equals power out over power in times 100% and at 100% is we end up with 97.5% efficiency. So this is down a little bit from the resistive control. Now you might say this isn't very impressive for PWM. Wait. Let's take a look at 70% duty cycle. Okay, so uh, duty cycle here is defined as the time on divided by the total time. Now, last time, the well, last time, yeah, uh, previously at 100%, the time on was equal to the total time per period. So this is basically one. So we would say that that is equal to tau, which is the time on divided by capital T, the PWM period, times 100% and what we know about the period is equal to 1 over the frequency. So uh, that will give us an idea 1 over F even though we don't use F too much in this uh, in this calculation that it is a function of frequency and we do have to watch for things if we're doing light control like flicker. Um, the eye seems to be okay down to about um, 20 Hertz I believe uh, motion picture cameras are 22 and those are sample systems because the shutter is opening and closing and so forth. So let's make sense more of this PWM period and I'm showing two of them on the board. One of them has a T here, capital T, and the other one is showing is one millisecond so these are the same thing and the time high since we're 70 percent is going to be 700 microseconds. So what we're seeing here as alluded to before is that this is a unipolar pulse, meaning it goes from zero in one direction. 
So what we would expect to see is some kind of DC component in here. And since it's changing in one cycle, we would expect to see some kind of AC component in here. So that's what it would look like and actually the 700 microseconds can be slid with my fingers anywhere within the PWM period. Now I'm showing it in the front end and that's where I'm always going to show it and it makes sense to do that. Okay. Now microcontrollers, just about anything today, um, has a peripheral that allows you to set up timers with a PWM option. And you can actually output this waveform because pulse width modulation is so common is that the manufacturers of microcontrollers see the need to accommodate a user by including that inside of the microcontroller's um, silicon circuitry. So, uh, yeah, we have a DC and AC component in here, and hopefully you can see that. And if you compare 700 microseconds on time versus what we had before with 100%, and just for the heck of it, before with 100%, is that that line would extend all the way over to here beyond all of the time okay so um, let's uh, let's go on and find some stuff about this here and the question is is find V effective so what's going to be the effective voltage with a PWM controller and I do not have a FET in here I don't want to complicate this with RDS on and it's going to vary from 0 to 10 volts. Once again, this is a unipolar waveform. So uh, this V effective is com composed of a direct current and AC current uh, component. And uh, power on is going to be total 10 watts. So in this circuit here, is, since we're not worried about RDS on, the maximum power we can have is 10 watts. Now, power output is 70 percent is going to be 0 0.7 times 10 watts equals 7 watts. So what we can say here, and this will be a conclusion which we'll wrap up later, is that the power is a direct function of the duty cycle. Let's see here, um, what else we have here? Uh, we want to find the effective voltage. So um, <clears throat> we have P equals V squared over R again. 7 square root of 7 watts times 10 ohms square root of 70 comes out to be 8.37 volts again not an obvious voltage for 70 percent duty size always good to check yourself uh, so I'm going to use my v squared over r equation here and when I do the math I end up with 7 watts so I'm pretty sure that that's the effective voltage. So, <clears throat> this is important, this here. Now, learn this. When two voltages are in a series, not DC sources, if you have two DC sources in series, you do the series aiding, series opposing technique that you learned in DC circuits. You do not do this calculation or if the AC sources are in series are of the same frequency then you take the phasers break them down into real and imaginary components add the reals add the imaginaries and then uh, take the square root of the sum of the squares to get the effective AC voltage at the same frequency if they vary by 0 0.5 Hertz believe it or not you have to use this equation to do it so, anytime that we're not in this category, the effective voltage is going to be equal to the square root of one of the voltages squared plus the other voltage squared. Now, in signal analysis, you're going to see this again in the numerator of the harmonic distortion equation, which is dealing with sinusoids that are multiples of the fundamental that are caused by nonlinearities. Uh, in whatever circuit that you're testing or building. So what we can do is decompose a pulse width modulator source into a DC component and an AC component and for this example that would be uh, 7.32 volts. Um, okay, 
So at 70% duty cycle, P equals 7 watts, and we know that VDC is 7 volts because the voltage is direct function of the duty cycle. We have V effective here. We know VDC, and the question then becomes is, well, what is the AC component? How do we find that? And we're going to have to do a little math to do that. And what we start out with is V effective is equal to VDC squared plus VAC squared, the square root of, and what we want to solve for is VAC. So, the way we do that is we square both sides. That gives us V efficiency squared equals VDC squared plus VAC squared. So we got rid of the radical. Move VCD over this side, which means we're going to subtract it. And then we have VAC squared isolated. Take the square root of that, and we got our guy here. Now notice that we're subtracting VDC squared from V effective squared, and then taking the square root of it. And in working through that, we end up with the square root of 2106, 21.06. And that comes out to be 4.59, and I'm using the volt RMS to designate this as the AC component as opposed to the effective component. So the effective voltage would be the DC equivalent, which would produce the same power. This voltage, the AC component, when combined with the DC component in the proper way, square root of the sum of the squares, would be equal to the effective voltage. So this is about the hardest math in here is realizing that when you have two voltage sources that it's just not a direct addition of the two of them. Okay, here let's do a little check. Um, 7 volts DC component, 4.5, 9 volts AC component equals what? Uh, 10 volts is 70% duty cycle we hope and adding them together gives us our V effective of 8.37 volts which uh, which makes sense. Okay. Now let's look at another extreme. We did 100 percent and we did 70 percent. Let's look at zero percent. So here's our PWM period again and this is our DT and to stay consistent with the examples I'll let T equal one millisecond and what we see is that the voltage coming out of our PWM controller is going to be zero all the way across a PWM cycle. So if it's zero, well I suppose V effective is going to be zero, VDC is going to be zero, VAC is going to be zero, I don't see any pulses in here, and the power now is going to be for all practical purposes zero watts. And I'm just saying that because with a FET there's a teeny teeny amount of leakage through it but we can throw that out and say really that the power obviously if we don't have a FET in the circuit and we're looking at this altruistically is going to be zero watts. So let's go back to the other extreme of a hundred percent duty cycle and we see the voltage here is a constant 10 volts and there is the end of our PWM period and this again will be a one millisecond period to stay consistent and we see that the V effective is now going to be 10 volts on all the time. VDC is going to be 10 volts on all the time. And since I don't see any pulses in here anywhere, the AC component is going to be 0 volts. So, one last example here is we're going to have a duty cycle of 50%. So here's our PWM period, which I've selected to be one millisecond, and 500 microseconds is going to be high, and 500 microseconds is going to be off. And tau, the time high, is going to be period over two, and this um, gives us a duty cycle equal to 50%. So time high divided by total time comes out to be 0 0.5, which when converted to a percent uh, is equal to 50%. So power 100% is 10 watts, and sometimes that's where you always start. 
And what we want to do is uh, find out what power is at 50%, and the power, like the DC voltage, is directly proportional to the duty cycle. So that's easy. It's going to be 5 watts. What's V effective? Well, V effective is going to be the square root of the power times uh, the resistance, which comes out to be 7.07 .07 volts. Now the question is, is finding VDC, just to do it mathematically, uh, 10 volts times the duty cycle expressed as a decimal will give us 5 volts. And to find the AC component, we're just going to take the effective voltage squared minus the DC voltage squared, and the square root of it, as we did before, and that comes out to be 5 volts. So, uh, what we can conclude about this is that if PMW signal is completely off, duty cycle 0%, there is no AC component, and if the PWM is 100% always on, there is no AC component. So if we combine these just to get an idea what the graph looks like on this here, a graphical relationship between power, the DC, and the AC component versus the duty cycle. So the duty cycle is going to be along the bottom here in an arbitrary units of voltage and power uh, we're going to have uh, for the, uh, the, the y-axis. So in this example, this is general does not concern the previous circuit. What we see in red is the power is a straight line as determined by the duty cycle. It's directly proportional. The DC component is a straight line directly determined by the duty cycle. And the AC component is zero when it's off and zero when it's completely on when there is no change and hits a maximum voltage at 50%. So the AC component varies from zero up to a max of 50% and increasing the duty cycle further reduces it back to zero. But notice that the DC component continues to climb and the power is related to the square. Now one other thing here is the power and DC component are a function of your graphing. The DC component may be above the power. It doesn't matter. I've just elected to draw it this way to kind of show the relationship between the DC component, the AC component, and the power. So uh, the AC component looks like an up-down smiley face. And to check yourself on this, you take the AC component, square it, DC component, square it, add them together, Take the square root, and at that point, it should give you the power. Finally, uh, pulse width modulation in the lab. And this is the circuit that uh, we're going to be using. And this is using a relatively old IRL530 device. And uh, it has an RDS on about 0 0.5 ohms. And the reason I want to keep this old device is if I upgraded this to a contemporary FET, is RDS on would be so low it would be easy to forget about it. We could obtain basically correct lab results not even paying attention to it. But RDS on in a contemporary device, a new device, is very important because the power dissipation is a function of the drain current squared times RDS on. So using this old part here is we're aware of it where in a new part it might be easy to forget it. Now what we want to do is not have to deal with having to adjust everything because of RDSI. So what we're going to do is tune it out of the picture. So um, what we're going to do is uh, we have our supply here which is about 10 volts and we're going to turn the FET on constantly, which would correspond to a 100% duty cycle, and then this is getting connected to a function generator, which is going to serve so that we can input our 10% and 20% so forth pulses. So if I take this and connect it, 
and many students don't do this, they don't read this part of the lab and they end up doing it over. Directly to our 10 volt supply, the Fed is on all of the time. Now, what we want to do in the lab is relate this to a voltage drop because this RL is not working against round. It's got a fit here. So if we put the DMM across this and adjust the supply voltage so that we see 10.0 volts here, effectively we have tuned out our DSI. Now, this has to be a true RMS voltmeter which is not something you're going to buy at the local store for six dollars. A true RMS voltmeter will give you the RMS voltage of any waveform. What we buy at the store, like a couple six dollar DMMs around here I use, um, is a peak reading meter for sinusoids only calibrated in RMS. So any waveform other than a sinusoid is not going to read correctly. So true RMS voltmeters obviously cost more money. Now the setup is once you get this set up, and this is 10 volts drop across this resistor, all you have to do then is change the input. And on the DMM, to get the DC component, you push the DC button. To get the AC component, you push the AC button. Simple as that. You don't have to move this anytime. You don't need two meters. One meter does both functions without issue. If you want to see what the input looks like, look at it at the gate. Now, the reason I'm saying that is this is an active low circuit. What the duty cycle would look like, and let's just say that this is 20% for the heck of it, is in the gate circuit, since it's active low, the 20% would be down here, and it wouldn't be at ground. It would be sitting on top of whatever the current is times IDSR. So this would be confusing. It's accurate. This is the way it looks for 20% duty cycle because this is an active low switch which is what the industry typically will use but to see the waveform and not be confused by it look at it at the gate because again this kind of like inverts the output the DMM is measuring the voltage drop it doesn't care it doesn't care whether the loads down here or up here or anywhere else it's just measuring the drop across the load so that will be set up in the lab and uh, as typically this lab is pretty stable we get good results the only trouble that I've seen on this is we have several types of DMMs and the newest the best per se offer a problem they, they fail to measure the AC component at 3 volts or less absolutely fail and that is surprising because these are the latest and greatest DMMs that we bought. So uh, the other older ones, we have a couple of them, work perfectly. So well, that will conclude. Oh, my director would like to say hello. Uh, there he is. Um, he's always concerned about cost overruns, and that's why we have this very expensive prop here. So anyway, uh, that will conclude for pulse wave modulation, and uh, thank you for watching.